you've been with us uh, the last couple months, we've gone through uh, the middle portion of Acts. We've got uh, four or five more weeks, but every week it's been, maybe you're getting to the point where you're realizing that every week the, uh, the, the author of Acts is telling us the same thing, just in different ways, different stories, different places. Again and again, we're seeing the gospel presented in new cities in, in, for new people, in, in not, not, the, not the insiders, but the outsiders. God is taking His Word through the Apostle Paul, through Barnabas, through Th- Silas and Timothy, taking it out, out, out again and again to new places, new people, people that are lost, people who have never heard the gospel. Uh, and we see again and again fruit. We see again and again people crossing over from death to life, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus as Lord, believing in Jesus for salvation. It's a beautiful, beautiful account and, and an incredible uh, account of salvation. God's working in our midst. Uh, I hope by now, maybe, maybe there's been a point in your past where, you realize, where, where you've thought, maybe I'm not supposed to share the gospel. Maybe God isn't calling me to be a messenger or a witness or an ambassador. I hope you've uh, been uh, you know, dis- disabused of that notion that you're not a gospel messenger, that you're not, as a Christian, somebody who has been called by Jesus to share. You're sent. You are an ambassador. You are a witness. You are a servant of Jesus, the messenger of the king, as it were. Uh, But I I know from uh, past surveys from this church, I know in in talking to people, I know hearing the buzz or the lack of buzz sometimes in the church, I I know that many of the people in our congregation, uh, long-term attenders, members, people that are here all the time, Many people in our church aren't in the habit, aren't in the rhythm of sharing their, their faith, aren't in the rhythm of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are not uh, oftentimes evangel- evangelistically focused or motivated, or we aren't going as, as, in Jesus' name. We, we, man, for a var- variety of reasons. Man, it seems like as the years go by, I'm counting up more reasons why. Now, there's always the beautiful thing about some of the surveys we've done and some of the conversations I've had. There's always people in the church who are sharing the gospel, and I I'm, I'm praise God for that. God's Spirit continues to move through His church. The church is the valley. We're not on a high ebb, you know, as the river right now is on a, a high water level, as it were. Uh, I, I wish we could get back to that time where all the churches of the San Luis Valley were in a high ebb, a high, a high flow, as it were, of sharing the gospel. But maybe one day we'll get back there. Maybe one day we'll, we'll come together as the, as the churches of the San Luis Valley and be about Jesus and His glory. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, and, and as I said, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of uh, things that keep us, obstacles. Uh, I think the biggest thing, as I've noticed over the years in talking to people and just hearing how they, they think about evangelism or how they talk about evangelism, about sharing the gospel, is fear. Fear is, is as the song says, is, is, is a liar. Fear is a great enemy. Fear is, is a great destroyer of our, our walking with Jesus in obedience. Uh, fear, fear of what people will think. Fear of what people will do. Fear of consequences if we share the gospel. I want to talk today, uh, is the scriptures uh, point that direction, about how to overcome fear. How do we faithfully serve Jesus and not give in to fear, not bow to fear, not cease walking in obedience to Jesus because of fear. How do we overcome fear? Please open your Bibles again to the book of Acts, Acts 18. We are in 18th chapter of Acts, verse 1. Uh, Paul has moved from Athens, a city that's uh, full of idols. Now he's coming to Corinth, a city famous for its commercialism, a city famous for its prostitution and its sexual immorality. Uh, Many people think that uh, Paul wrote the book of Romans from Corinth. Uh, As he's imagining in chapter 1 all the sexual immorality of of the things of the world, he's imagining Corinth and some of the sights and some of the things he saw in that wicked, wicked city. Chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. In AD 49, Tiberius uh, Caesar uh, commanded everybody to leave, all the, all the Jews, uh, all, the, all the Christians. He was confused about that there was a differentiation there. And so the, there's a lot of refugees coming from Rome. 
And these people, Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla, as some of your translations say, uh, they ended up in Corinth. Uh, he went to see them, Paul did, and, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, tent makers, it, literally tent makers. There, there wasn't a church in Corinth to support him financially as, as the preacher, as, as, as the, the minister. Uh, so he, he, during the week, he, he made tents. He grew up in Tarsus in uh, the mountains of, of south, uh, southeast uh, Turkey, as we call it today. His, his father was a master tent maker, and so Paul knew how to put t- tents together, how to make tents. And he'd make them during the week, sell them to pay the bills, to buy food, to, to take care of himself. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we're going to have a missionary come in a, in a few weeks, Eileen Fitzpatrick. She uh, lived in North Africa for several, several years, and she's going back in the mission field soon. And she was a tent maker in another sense uh, while she was there. She, she brought a vocation. She, she lived in, in North, North Africa. Uh, she, she brought her physical therapy skills to the t- table. She, she was in country. She was allowed to be in country to, to serve people with her, with her medical skills, her, her physical therapy skills. And so tent making is a huge thing. We'll get to hear from her in a few weeks. But Paul, the original tent maker, <laughs> was, was paying the bills, as it were. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. We, we've seen this again and again, the pattern. He'd go to the synagogue first, but he could only go on Sabbath days, Saturday. He had to work the rest of the week. But, verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, remember that he left them in, in Philippi, the town of Philippi, the city of Philippi? Uh, we learned from another, another epistle that uh, they took up a, a love offering there. They took up an offering, and, 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 and when Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia now to Achaia, uh, the southern Greece, uh, they bring an offering. Now Paul doesn't have to work right, in, in terms of like tent making. Now he can go full-time into the gospel. Now he can pour himself into the work. It says when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. That's the gospel, the word of God, testifying to the Jews that Christ, that the Christ was Jesus. He announced again and again, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the king who is to come, who's going to bring his kingdom. And you should believe in him. He, he died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. Now he reigns, and he calls you to trust in him. He calls you to put your faith in him as Lord of all, and he will save you if you trust him. He will save you if you believe in him, not just now, temporarily, but eternally. So the, the gospel went out powerfully because the church supported these missionaries. Uh, we have missionaries in our midst that are still raising support, and let's keep the pedal to the metal till they get to the field. Uh, that's that's the, op, the, the glory of the church working together as the body of Christ. To all, we're all in mission together. Some are goers, some are givers, prayers. You know, we all do our part. So the church in Philippi, uh, they were one of the only churches to give uh, from Macedonia, and they blessed Paul so he could be full-time preaching the gospel. Uh, but uh, as he went into the synagogue and, and he, he went through the town, they opposed and reviled him. Uh, they, they abused him, uh, f- verbally slandering him. Uh, different translations bring out the different uh, facets of that word. He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. <laughs> now, shaking out the garments is something that Jews would sometimes do in Gentile lands to say, I'm done with you. You haven't, you haven't responded to God. You haven't listened to God. I'm done with you. It's like shaking out all the, off the crumbs, so to speak. Uh, I'm done with you. Uh, your blood be on your own heads. You know, the prophets in the Old Testament, God told them, hey, you bring my word to the people, and if you fail to tell them the truth, their, their blood is on your head, so to speak. So Paul takes that, that idea, and he says, hey, you're responsible now. I've, I brought the gospel to you. You've rejected it. And so now you face condemnation on your own. You, you, you've, you've, you've forsaken the word of God. You've forsaken the way that he's provided. You've rejected Jesus as the Christ. Now you deal with your own sins. You deal with the consequences. The wages of sin is death, spiritual death, eternal death. That's on you now because you rejected Jesus Christ. If you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, please... Turn to Jesus and be saved. Put your faith in him today for salvation. Do not leave earth without Jesus, as they say. Do not go to the grave without Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
So here's, uh, here, here's the, the, the Apostle Paul. He, he's being reviled by the Jews in that synagogue, slandered, hated, rejected. He says, I'm going to the Gentiles. This whole group of people that have never heard the gospel, have no hope of salvation, who have earned death and hell. He says, I'm going to the Gentiles to bring the gospel to them. And he left there and went to the house of the man named uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. In other words, a God-fearer, a Gentile who uh, became a monotheist without becoming a Jew. And then he became a Christian. He believed in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. His house, he didn't have to go far when he left the synagogue. His house was right next door. Crispus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. and Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Interestingly, uh, Jesus comes in a vision and says, uh, at least in this translation in verse, verse 10, no one will attack you. But then verse 12, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about your words and names and your own law, see to it yourself, I refuse to be a judge of these things. In other words, they were saying, he's, he's breaking the Jewish law. He's, he's doing things contrary to our law, the Torah, our instructions that we receive from God. And, the, and the, the Gentile guy, he says, I don't care about your law. I don't, you know, if it was a matter of breaking Roman law, it'd, it'd be another matter. So he drove them from the tribunal, the judgment seat, the bema seat, as it were. In the Agora, in the marketplace, there was a, a place where the, the leader, the, the town officials would make judgments, the bema seat, the judgment seat. He drove them from that place, the tribunal, as, as the ESV says, and they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, the, the one following Crispus. <laughs> Uh, I love that name. Uh, that's another baby name for you, Crispus. Uh, but anyway, Sothenes is, is uh, the fault one who followed him, the, the, the next ruler of synagogue, and, and the Gentiles beat him there. Maybe, maybe there's some people that didn't like the Jewish people in their town, and the Gentiles took advantage of the, 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 the city official rejecting him, and, and they beat him out there in front of the judgment seat. So interesting matters. Um, Jesus promised Paul that he wouldn't be attacked to harm, and the promise that Jesus made to Paul comes true right away. They, they planned attack. They tried to attack. They tried to break him down. They tried to destroy him, but it didn't happen because God was with him. God promised that he'd take care of him. Uh, we, we come to this text, and, and we see the Apostle Paul. Uh, we, we see our own fears. We see our own anxieties and our own worries about things. Uh, we, we come to the Apostle Paul, and, and we're, we're, we're kind of surprised to find out that Jesus had to encourage him. Uh, we think Apostle Paul, we see so many times he seems so fearless. He seems so bold. He seems like nothing can stop him. That he just goes in any, everywhere, and, and he's, he's just like uh, this, this, this machine. Like nothing phases him. He seems to be Teflon, you know, no notions, no, no in terms of his, his worries or anxieties or fears. But it's not true. He's a man. He's a person just like you and I, and uh, we have our high times where we're strong and, and bold and courageous, and we have seasons maybe where we're fearful or worried or we're just filled with anxiety. Uh, it seems that coming into Corinth, Paul was, uh, was on that low ebb. If you look uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just to get a little perspective, uh, the, the letter he wrote to Corinth later on, maybe... Uh, I guess it's some three years later or something like that. Uh, the letter he wrote to Corinth in chapter 2, verse 1, he kind of reveals like how he came to the city, how, you know, how he met them. Chapter 2, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. I, and I, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, uh, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. 
the Corinthians were so full of themselves about human wisdom. We're so smart, we have human wisdom and human philosophers. We're, we're so great. But he says, I didn't come that way with human wisdom. I, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't come with hum, human ph- wisdom or human philosophy. He came with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Uh, we wonder why he was so afraid. Um, I mean, he saw Jesus. He saw the Lord. He, he, he met him and, and he saw so many miracles and so much strength and so much power. So much wonderful things in his life. It's a blessing from the Lord. But he came in weakness and trembling and in fear. And, and, and again, we wonder why. Well, maybe his past traumas caught up with him. You know, we, we in the last, I don't know, in my last 20 years, all I hear is about trauma in the past and how it affects people, and it, and it does. Now, think about the Apostle Paul when, when he was the silent years in Tarsus. We, we, it seems like he went through a lot of abuse there, a lot of, a lot of uh, physical abuse, a lot of uh, attacks, uh, just from some of his other letters. And then the first missionary journey... <laughs> All the abuse he took, all the physical attacks, all the imprisonments, uh, all the things that came against him. And then the second missionary journey that we're on now, the same things have been happening. It's a, it's a common pattern. Like he's, he's going to the synagogue, uh, some fruit, that, there's some Jews that believe, there's some Gentiles that believe, some god fears that believe. Uh, things are going well, and, then, and then, then, then something happens. Somebody gets jealous. Or because the Christians are turning to Jesus, people are turning to Jesus and becoming Christians, some people are losing money in, in like prostitution or, 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 or certain bad uh, moral things going on, like, like the, the soothsayer that, you know, when she turned to the Lord and she was saved, they, they couldn't make money off her anymore. And, and, or they, they stopped selling idols because people weren't buying the idols anymore because they came to Christ. Just all kinds of things happen, and, and there was a hatred directed towards Paul uh, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Luke, uh, that, that, that really ended up bad. He, he, you know, we, we've read some of the things that he went through. And, and so maybe we, we think that when he came to Corinth, he was just like, he was just done. Like, I don't know if I can go through this again. He, he went in the synagogue, you know, and, and then they started abusing him and they started slandering him. And, and maybe there was a breakdown. Maybe there was a moment of, of just, just like, I don't think I can go here anymore. And Jesus met him right where he was. The Lord Jesus came to him in a vision and explained uh, why he should go forward, why he should continue sharing the gospel, why he should not be silent. And they're they're, they're beautiful words. In verse 9, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, no one will attack to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. Uh, that, that, That initial prohibition or that initial command, do not be afraid, uh, that's something that's, uh, that, that's one of the most common commands in the Bible. Do not fear, do not be afraid. Uh, As a believer in God, as a, as a person that's in his kingdom, as a person that's part of his, his eternal family now, the Lord says to you and I, do not be afraid. He, he actually goes so far to prohibit it. Do not be afraid, and we're told again and again and again. And yet we, we struggle with fear. We, we struggle with that command to obey it, to keep it. Uh, maybe part of it is, is our, you know, God knows. God knows if there's, if there's some mental illness in us or there's some weakness in us, uh, in our minds, he knows. He doesn't hold us guilty for things we can't control. Uh, he knows if, if, our, if our minds, because of past traumas or past issues, uh, just go overdrive and we can't stop the squirrels from spinning the squirrel cage. And You know what I mean? We, he knows. He knows the things that are out of our control. He loves us. He, he cares for us. He knows. But the command is, do not be afraid. 
And so we need to take that seriously. When fear arises, we know that the command is not to be afraid. So we have to fight it. We have to stand against it. We have to boldly say, I'm not going to be afraid. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. because That's easier said than done. But nevertheless, we make a decision. I'm not going to be afraid. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the things that he faced, let, let, let's just be honest, we don't face the things that he faced usually. He did f- face, uh, you know, not just slander or having his name run through the mud. We're, we're afraid of that for sure. We don't share the gospel because of slander or our loss of reputation. But he, he, was, he was really afraid of physical attack, physical beating. You know, being in prison, the, the people that he served when they, came, when they became part of the church, you know, they, they feared losing their house, losing, losing everything they owned. They, they feared uh, real tangible, you know, real life things that you, you can't get back, you know. You get beaten enough, like the Apostle Paul, you might have a physical disability for the rest of your life if you don't die, <laughs> right? Our, and we don't face that typically, the worst we faced is a, is a social media rebuke sometimes. Like we get, a, we, hey, the, Jerron's a Bible thumper. You know, it gets out on social media, Jerron's a Bible thumper. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm so horrified by that. That's the end of the world. Is it? I don't think it is. Or uh, maybe uh, we, we fear things that, that are real. Let, let's admit it. We fear perhaps more than physical attack. Maybe physical attack's coming. Maybe we'll be part of a community somewhere where the church is attacked or a, a people are attacked. I don't know. It, do, it doesn't seem like it's lining up that way in the short term, maybe in the long term. But we, we fear more like economic loss, don't we? Like if you're a business owner, it gets out that you're a Bible thumper. and it's a, It gets out that you're doing things by Jesus' way. Maybe you're going to lose some customers. You're going to lose some, some people that come to your business because, oh, those Christians, those crazy Christians. Maybe some people fear that. Or maybe as em- employees, maybe we, f- we fear if it got out that I was uh, witnessing, if it got out that I was you know, sharing the gospel because I love people and I want to see them in heaven, if it got out that I was that kind of person, maybe I'd get passed over p- for a promotion. Maybe if it wouldn't be put on the right team or the good team, I'd, I'd get the bad shifts or something. Maybe there'd be some attacks that way. It could happen. Uh, may, maybe, uh, maybe we could even lose our job. There's some corporations that are pretty heavy-handed these days about proselytizing others. Uh, maybe that could happen. Maybe there's some cities that uh, prohibit certain things and you might lose your job. Uh, you know, so we, we do have things to fear, but when it comes to fear, uh, I think oftentimes we, our, our minds... Um, God has given us uh, the ability to imagine things, the God-given ability to imagine. We have, I think, more than, any, uh, more than the creatures that God has made, the, the, sometimes the distinction between humanity and creatures is we can foresee things, we can imagine ourselves in the future, we can place ourselves out there. That's a God-given ability, right? And, and, and sometimes when, when, with that ability, we, we go there. And, and maybe you're one of these people that you always go to the worst-case scenario. If I get cancer, the worst-case scenario is. If, uh, if uh, I lose my job, the worst-case scenario is. You know, if, if my, my family rejects me, and another fear that we have maybe of sharing the gospel is rejection of relationships, that my family might ostracize me or push me out or something like that. Our mind goes to the worst-case scenario. We have that ability with our imagination uh, one of the things that I, I learned uh, a long time ago, but I, I was reminded the other day listening to the radio, was uh, our problem with fear and the future is that when we go into the future and we imagine the outcomes of our actions negatively, we very often don't take God there. In other words, maybe, it's, maybe you've experienced this. I've experienced it again and again. When I start thinking about my worst case scenarios, my worst outcomes, uh, God is strangely absent from my imagination. I become a practical atheist, in other words. When, when, we, you know, when, when the Bible talks about anxiety and fear, it's, it's talking about uh, oftentimes bad theology that we have. Uh, a bad theology 
tied with our imaginations, you know, that God isn't powerful, God doesn't love me, God, God is not everywhere, you know, all the bad theology that's out there, the limiting God, put him in the boxes. We tie that to, with our imagination. We go like three weeks out, like, man, if, if that court date happens a certain way, I'm going to jail, you know. But isn't God three weeks out? Or my business, man, if, if things don't line up just right, I'm going to lose my business. It, you know, we, we don't think, isn't God going to be with us next month in that place? Isn't he the same sovereign God that he is today? He is. He is hope for the hurting, as we sang. He is. He will be. He was. Don't, don't let your mind go to the future without God. The same God that is with you today, the same sovereign God who's all-powerful and almighty, who loves you, is the same God that will be with you in the future and all those anxieties that you, that you come up with and all those fears and all those worries. Place your faith in God not just today, but tomorrow as well. God will be there in your whatevers or what ifs tomorrow too. Uh, we, we, we come here, and the, the, the promises, we have to ask the question, are, are these promises applicable to us? Because you know, he gives the command. It's a famous command. It's throughout the Bible, do not be afraid. It's for all believers. We are to fight against fear. We're to overcome fear. We're to, to crush our fear. But then there's the promise, and it's just as famous. Do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent. 4, verse 10, I am with you. This, this is another promise that is throughout the Bible the I am is with us. I am with you. I am always with you. Man, the, the Israelites, remember when they came out at Passover, when they came out of, of, of Egypt, and they saw the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night? And even then, they, 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 they didn't believe their eyes. They didn't be, believe Moses' promises through God giving Moses' promises. They, they didn't be, believe the truth. They saw Pharaoh's army coming out to attack, and they didn't believe that God was with them. If God is with us, Paul says, who can be against us? I, I mean, you, you go through so many places. I am with you. A promise. Take that into your future. Take that into your morals. Take that into your bad imagination. Take that into your bad theology. I am with you. It's, it's beautiful. But, but he goes on from there and he gives a couple more sub-promises, as it were. Are these for us? The, the, the second one, no one will attack you or harm you. We already addressed that in, in one sense. But the third one, for I have many people in, in this city, many who are in this city who are my people. Now, that's an interesting one. What, what does that mean? I think what it means is there's a lot of people in Corinth that have yet to be saved. A lot of people... Uh, in the foreknowledge of God, in, in the, the, the calling of God. There's, there's people that were appointed for salvation and had not yet been saved, as it talks about in Acts 13, 48. Everyone appointed for salvation came to life. Uh, he's saying, Paul, I've got work for you to do. I, I've got people that are, still need to hear the gospel and come to life and be saved. I've got a lot of people... I've got a big harvest ahead, in other words. Don't fear that you're going to get destroyed or crushed. And so that, that comes to Paul. And I think, reasonably thinking, I mean, God hasn't told me. His sovereign will, he hasn't told us everything. But I believe there's still people in the San Luis Valley that are his that need to come to life. Are those hundreds? Are those thousands? You know, God has a calling on us. Uh, we, we, we could dwell in fear and like what's going to happen to us and lose sight of the mission, lose sight of there's people out there that God has loved in eternity past, that God has loved since the beginning of the creation before the, the world was born. He's written into his book and he's calling us to go and bring them the words of life. We could dwell in fear and miss that opportunity or we could believe that he has work for us to do that matters and trump our fears to see the fruit. But, but the second one, you know, it, we have to address that one as well. Um, is, is, I think the third one is, is for us generally, and I think it's true that he has mission and 
We shouldn't let fear overcome because we're still on mission until he takes us home. Um, I'm with you. Uh, the second one, no one will attack you or harm you. Um, th- this one, is that, is that just for Paul? Is that for us too? <laughs> now, uh, I have to say, uh, generally, this, this one is specifically for Paul. Uh, and why, specifically for Paul, specifically for Corinth. Because we've seen in our journey through Acts that again and again, Paul wasn't kept from harm in other cities. As we go on from here and we look at Acts or we read the epistles, Paul isn't going to be kept from harm in other cities. <laughs> First missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, his being taken to Rome. He suffered harm in the name of Jesus Christ everywhere he went. But this, this promise, and the same for us, you know, 2 Timothy 3.12, if you look at that, second three, he's got it up on the screen, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Uh, we, uh, we, we know that that's a promise to us. It, this, this idea that if we're walking faithfully with Jesus, if we're obeying Jesus, if we're trusting him, that, that we will never suffer harm is just not true. Now, for Paul, maybe it was important that the grace came to him in Corinth. It was a specific promise for him. Paul, while you're here, no one's going to harm you. And that's what sovereign God can do. Now, now the fact that that promise isn't for us, uh, I think, doesn't mean that God doesn't protect. Of course he does. How many, how many times last week did God keep me from Satan's attack? How many times did God thwart the enemy's designs against me and my family? How many, how many ways did he keep me from getting in a car accident? How many ways did he keep me, you know, God only knows. But his grace is sufficient for today. I mean, he's an awesome God. But the, the idea that, that somehow because we're Christians, suddenly we're free from suffering is just not True, especially if we share the gospel. Because we know from time immemorial that people hate the truth. People reject the truth. People hate the messengers sometimes. And so if we are faithful, yeah, we, we might be attacked. But you go back to the first promise. Even if you are attacked, even if you do suffer for Jesus, even if you are uh, slandered or even if you do lose your job, I am is with you. The promise is that he never, you know, Jesus, remember when the, the command, he, what he said to the apostles when he called them to the mountain in Galilee at the end of, of Matthew, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age, I am with you. And we know theologically that uh, God, as we became believers and we trusted in Christ, that the Spirit of God came in us. God is indwelling us. He's with us. The Father's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus is with us right now. Where two or three are gathered or where a hundred are gathered, Jesus is in their midst. Jesus is here right now. And that tells me I'm safe. Now, if you have bad theology, you might make Jesus limited or you might, make, you might run down the path of, well, he's powerful, but he isn't loving. Or he's powerful, he's loving, but he's not wise. You know, or, or you, could, you could all go on those, all, those, all those traps of the world. But when you know who Jesus is, when you know who God is, you know if God is with you, you know that you are ultimately safe. Let me unpack that a little bit. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, a, great, a great passage if you struggle with anxiety or fear, one to meditate on, one to uh, process and uh, run through again and again, pull some principles out of it to live by. Hmm. Go to uh, verse uh, 28, please. Chapter 10, verse 28. Uh, He's talking about not having fear in this whole passage. He says, "So, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed. I'm verse, I'm sorry, I started reading 26. Verse 28 Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, feel. Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Initially, that's not very encouraging, <laughs> but it is encouraging when you think about it. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, 
you're more, you're worth more, you're more value than many sparrows. And it goes on from there. But uh, several things here when we talk about thinking about God clearly. When it says uh, about the two sparrows sold for a penny, in the world's eyes, they're worthless. In the world's eye, world's eye, in, and they'd sell sparrows, the poor would buy sparrows for food, or they'd use them for offerings or sacrifices. They, they were basically worthless for a penny. But it says, not one of them will follow the ground apart from your father. In other words, uh, worthless things in the world, um, the world thinks worthless thoughts of. They, they don't care. But even the sparrow, God knows when that sparrow falls. God is in control of that sparrow's death, life and death. God is in control of our death. He knows the day of our birth. He knows the day of our death. He's, uh, he's got it covered. In other words, He's sovereign. We worship and we serve and we walk with a sovereign God who does all things, who sustains life, who made life, who brings the end of our life. We live and move and have our being in this God who is in control. The things that might come against you are never random contingencies bouncing against one another. They're never these crazy, wild uh, happenstances that just randomly fly about and come to roost in your life. God is in control. He will not let anything into your life that He doesn't let pass through His sovereign will, His good will first. You are always in His hand no matter what He allows to come. More on that in a minute. But verse 30, But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Not only is God sovereign, not only does He know all things, why would you count someone's hairs? Or lack thereof? Why would you care? You would if you cared about somebody. You'd know them inside and out. You'd know every last detail about their life. He cares about you to the nth degree, to the highest power you can imagine. If anybody can care about you to that, it's only God can. And so maybe your dermatologist or your hair replacement therapist knows the numbers of hair follicles you have because they've counted them, but I, I don't think that they do it because they love you. God does because He loves you. All-powerful, sovereign God is in control. All-powerful, sovereign God who can do all things loves you dearly, cares for you dearly. You are safe in the Father's hands. Always. But you, but, uh, but you say, oh, man, if, if God loved me, why did that happen? Why did I go through that tribulation? Why did I go through the trial? Why did you take my mom? Why did you take my dad? Why did you let that go on? If you love me, if God loves me, if God's all-powerful and God is in control, why? Oh, that's where we come to trust. We come to trust that if God allows trouble or trial or tribulation in our life, if He allows us to suffer for such things as sharing the gospel... He has good purposes and good reasons for it. And I don't, I don't have time to, to dive in too much farther, but remember when we went through Acts 7 and 8 as we started this sermon series? Do you remember how we, uh, we turned um, that direction and um, we started talking about uh, Stephen's martyrdom and how he stood for the Lord. He was a great preacher. He, he, he loved people. He served people as a deacon in the church. And then he's martyred. He's killed. He's stoned. We're like, how could that happen? And as a result of Stephen's martyrdom, they're, 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 the, the attack begins. The apostle, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, and, the, and the, the, the zealous Jews of the city, they turn attack against the believers in Jerusalem, and they, they go after him to destroy him, and they flee for their lives. They leave their homes. They, they leave everything behind. We, how could that be good? 
How could, but then, then we read about how because of the persecution, the church that was supposed to be going was supposed to be winning the Gentiles. They were forced out of the city. And because they were forced out of the city, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people heard the gospel for the first time. And how many of those people will be in heaven? Because they believed the gospel. They responded to the preaching of the gospel from fleeing people in distress. Praise God. He, you got, we come to believe, we come to trust. In overcoming fear, God always works for good. Even in the tough things, even in the hard things, even in our losses, God always works for good for those who love Him and call according to His purposes. God is always acting out of love. Love seeks the highest end, the highest goal, the best out of the circumstances. God's ways are higher than ours. God's way, God works in ways we don't understand. He's working on planes and putting things together. The tapestry that He's weaving together, He sees things we don't. We are called to trust Him. That He's always, even in the cancer, even in the miscarriage, even in the divorce, even when sin comes about through other people, He's going to do what He's going to do for good ends. And so, man, we could live in fear. We could, we could dwell in fear about this happening or that happening. What if I share the gospel and I get fired? What if I share the gospel and I'm hated? What if I share the gospel and I get beat up? Well, that's the last part of this, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. <laughs> Rather, fear, fear him who can kill the, both the body and soul into hell. In other words, it's, it's Jesus' way of saying, now that you've given your life to Jesus Christ, now, now that you've given your life to me, now that you've entrusted your life to me and you've turned yourself over to me, what's the worst thing they can do to you? The worst thing they can do to you is take you to your reward. The worst thing they can do to you is take your life. And for Christians to go to heaven, that's the best thing ever. You have nothing to lose. You have nothing to sorrow over. You have nothing to be distraught over if you already have turned your life over to Christ and you belong to Him. Don't fear the world. Seek to please God. Uh, yeah, you guys, say no to fear. Say no to fear by trusting in the Lord Almighty who loves you and will love you forever. Praise God. Please stand in His presence. Could you put the doxology up, please? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. But God, we ask that you give us power to trust you. We ask that you give us power to praise you in our fears. We ask that you give us power to walk with you no matter what. We ask for the power to be your people, that we could be bearers of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you would see many people come to you, that there would be people added to your church, that you would make worshipers out of those who hate you even now. Be glorified, be magnified by your church, Lord. Thank you for making us yours and thank you for loving us for eternity. God bless you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace, everybody.